Hey everyone. Before this video starts, I wanted to take a moment to do a shout out for a family friend called D's Bees Honey. And you can see their website at dzbzhoney.farm. And I'll also link that in the description. And I did this once before, and just like last time, this isn't sponsored or anything. I just wanted to shout out their business. But they make CBD infused honey, and you can get it with or without THC. And it's really good for like minor aches or pains if you experience those. And they also sell CBD honey candies. They did give me a discount code that I can give to people. So if you do want to try out something there, you can use the code Somnium to get 20% off. But yeah, I just want to shout them out. I hope you all are having a good day and I hope you enjoy the story. I'm excited to see what you think. My fascination with traveling to the stars began the night my sister died. It was a cold night. We were up in the treehouse using the telescope Grandpa had gifted me for my seventh birthday when she jabbed a finger toward the sky, pointing at a shooting star and shouting, We should make a wish, Quentin. I remember thinking it was a lot larger than any I'd seen before, and a few moments later, it got so big that it blotted out the moon. With deafening speed, it zoomed overhead and smashed into the forest right behind our house, toppling massive trees like they were matchsticks and scorching a trail of dead earth to an impact site the size of a small car. My sister and I didn't even have to exchange words before we were bounding down the rope ladder and rushing into the woods. It was smaller than I expected, perhaps the size of a bowling ball, but it was unlike anything I'd ever seen, dark orange and glowing with the light of a thousand stars. What is it? Renee asked as she reached out to touch the stone. A moment later, she was screaming and flailing on the ground as she clutched her wrist with her legs buckled. I ran to her side and looked at her palm, both frightened and fascinated to see that every bit of her skin had been scorched off. I carried her to the house, shouting to my parents for help as she kept screaming. As I looked down at her, I saw that the burns were beginning to spread down her arm, scalding her body like a spreading disease. She didn't stop her wails until we made it to the hospital. Once in the emergency room, several well-dressed men pulled my dad aside and talked in hushed tones about what was happening. I didn't understand many of the words, but none of it sounded good. Certain phrases like quarantine and special treatment rang in my ears as I tugged at dad's coat. Is Renee going to be okay? Are they going to make her better? I asked. He brushed me away and tried to remain calm, listening as the men told him they would need to take Renee immediately before her condition got any worse. What's wrong with her? Where are you taking her? I asked frantically. Dad signed paperwork, and in a flash, they were wheeling my sister toward a private ambulance. Quentin! Quentin! She shouted as she passed me by. I will never forget the panic in her eyes, the flesh melting that was deforming every part of her body. She grabbed a hold of my left arm, begging me to save her. Her touch was like fire, and I instinctively pulled away, feeling my own flesh turn a dark black as she was taken away. We were told they would update us in 48 hours about her condition, but we never got a single phone call. The stars did this to her, Papa, and I'm going to find out why. I remember telling Dad. In his bitterness and rage, he blamed what happened to her on me. If you hadn't filled her head with fantasies of spacemen, she would still be here. No one cares about the moon anymore, Quint. You need to wake up and forget about it. He spat as he dismantled my telescope. I promised him I would never bring it up again, and for the next twenty years, I stayed true to my word. Then I met Isaac. It was spring of 2012. I was busy frittering away my inheritance on college courses that any sane person would avoid, like fringe science and parapsychology, when we bumped into each other, trying to check out the same book from the university's library. Let's just study together and kill two birds with one stone, Isaac suggested once we made introductions. Before I knew it, I found myself admiring everything about him, from his decisive attitude to his calming eyes. I soon learned that, like me, Isaac dreamed of seeing the stars. Pretty crazy, huh? No, not at all. I've wanted to be an astronaut since I was a kid, but my dad told me it was just a stupid dream. Yeah, I guess he isn't wrong, huh? I mean, it's not like the space program is going around recruiting anymore. Well, that's not entirely true. NASA still trains men and women every year for lunar missions, and most of the ones selected wind up stationed on the ISS. Huh. Sounds like you didn't give up on that dream after all. Isaac teased. Well then, let's do it. Let's go to the moon! What? 
how? By studying and putting ourselves out there every chance we get. We'll blow them away, prove our dads wrong, and make our own history. What do you say? So that's what we did for the next year. We took on courses in astronomy and physics, engineering and geology, and went to every seminar, every rally, and signed up for every conference on the space program. We volunteered, campaigned, and represented ourselves as much as possible for the university, and even started our own club to get the cause heard. One week ago, all of our efforts finally paid off. The headmaster pulled us aside with urgent news. A recruiter from Florida had come to speak to us. Isaac and I could hardly contain our excitement as we were ushered into a private room and suddenly found ourselves standing face to face with a decorated officer of the space program. Gentlemen, I'm Commander Alexa Ferris. Please take a seat. The dark-haired woman said formally as we shook hands. As you may have assumed, my presence here is to determine whether or not you meet the criteria to be approved as a candidate for an upcoming lunar mission. Both of you have demonstrated over the past 12 months your determination and skills when it comes to such an assignment, so none of those abilities are in question here. What you need to be aware of is the delicacy of the operation. Signing up is tantamount to casting your old life away. Everything, anything, and everyone you ever knew will be a thing of the past. You will become a part of a classified group that is not acknowledged by any government on Earth. And you will be disavowed by all associates and enterprises. In short, if you become a part of our team, you will be ghosts. She gave us a curt smile and encouraged us to discuss amongst ourselves the implications here. You haven't even told us what we're getting involved with. How can you expect us to be on board with it? I wasn't quite as critical, but I did have a few questions of my own. What was the deadline for departure? Would we be given the chance to change our mind in the future? And most importantly, what would we be doing? Alexa offered what little information she could, but stressed that any details would only be given once we signed on the dotted line. I understood her need for discretion, but Isaac did not. This feels wrong. Uh, could you give us a moment? I said, pulling him out to the hall. What's going on with you? Isn't this everything we've worked for? I asked in a hushed tone. I was about to ask you the same thing, Quentin. I thought we wanted to go to the moon, not become a part of some clandestine project. We don't know anything to base our statements on, or even a way to verify who this woman is. It all seems rather sketchy. But don't flake on this now. What if this is the only chance we get? Shouldn't we take a leap of faith? It's just... It's all happening so suddenly, and without notice. I know we said we wanted this, but can't we do the same initiatives we've always fought for, right here? I could see in his eyes that he had already made up his mind, and it broke my heart. I thought we were in this together. His stature stiffened, and his expression grew cold. Hmm. I thought so, too. Looks like I didn't realize what really mattered most. That was the last time we ever saw one another. I watched as he left without even so much as a goodbye, and then turned to see Alexa was standing there, waiting for my own decision. I remembered thinking of all the people I wanted to prove wrong, now I was adding the man I loved to that list. Over the next 24 hours, Alexa transported me and two other candidates to an undisclosed location. Even stepping foot on the freighter was considered classified, and we were treated the way I imagined slaves were. Pushed down to cargo holds and then quickly sedated. When we woke up, all I could sense was a rush of cold air, our surroundings resembling something akin to a dormant volcano. After being given a chance to eat and shower, Alexa took us to a conference room where an old school projector was hooked up. What you are about to hear will change your perception of the world you are about to leave. At first I thought that it was all just for show, to instill a sense of awe in our mission. But that all changed moments later, when the lights dimmed and an image of a massive lunar outpost appeared on screen. It looked to be the size of a small city hidden among the craters. The structure you are looking at is Fort Alsbury. It is the largest man-made building off-planet next only to the ISS itself. As you may have guessed, much like the program you have enlisted in, the very existence of Alsbury is considered top secret. She began. The next few slides showed us pictures of the facilities in her corridors, which included everything from a swimming pool to a greenhouse. It was impressive to see, and I wondered how long it had taken to build a place like this. Next came the meat of our discussion. The reason we were chosen. 
With already 16 staff members aboard, your mission will be to assist and provide support for our current project. That of colonization. Sorry to interrupt, but did you just say colonization? As in, people living on the moon? It's Owen, correct? Yes, ma'am. Owen Sanders. I'm going to have to ask you to please hold off all questions until the end, Mr. Sanders. Water is the most precious resource on the moon. For the past six months, the team has been focusing on attempting to breach this pocket of the lunar subterranean area we call Lake Severn. It's about 4,700 feet in diameter, and from our scans, has a 77% liquid base amid the other materials. Our goal is to successfully mine this lake, along with other locations on the moon's surface over the next 10 years. And you will be a part of that. I snapped back as the next slide showed a large area beneath the lunar base that was being mined. I couldn't believe my ears, but the excitement only grew from this moment. We signed a lot of NDAs, went through weeks of extensive training, and even more to withstand the launch, and finally we departed from Earth around mid-morning. I remember watching the globe fade away amid the stars, and thinking how lucky I was to be doing exactly what I always wanted to do with my life. Little did I know, but the secrets that the moon had to offer would haunt me forever. Landing and debriefing with the station's chief happened around 1700 hours, and we were given necessary immunizations by the staff's physician. I did my best to memorize all of the names of the senior staff. Cyrus Gordon, Chief of Operations. Dr. Clara Rowland, Chief of Medicine. Alexa Ferris, Chief of Security. Professor Francine Landry, Chief Astrophysicist. Caleb Littell, Chief of Maintenance, T.J. Armitage, Chief of Engineering, and then my direct supervisor, Tyler White, the Chief Science Officer. Owen and I would be working directly underneath him in the weeks to come. There's a lot to take in, and I'm sure you'll adjust your surroundings soon enough. But as it stands, we're going to need all staff to be on high alert as we enter the subterranean pocket at 0700 hours tomorrow. Our goal is to stabilize the area determine whether or not it's a viable location for creating an artificial ocean, and also to excavate all resources and determine their usefulness to our primary mission. I felt like I was on a roller coaster with all the sudden revelations. That evening, I went to the observation tower which faced east toward the shadow of the moon and spent the night watching the stars and thinking about the choices that had led me here. They look different from this point of view, don't they? Professor Landry smiled at me softly as she joined me to peer up at the expanse. It's amazing. All these years of discovery to come to the stars, and the answers to our future might just be beneath our feet this entire time. I guess that makes this place a little lonely, when everyone else is so focused on the lake. Oh, I don't know about that. I like to think of the pike as my fortress of solitude. She said with a smirk, and when I inquired about the nickname, she gestured to the angles of the tower and explained, Surely you noticed on your descent its peculiar design? I didn't want to admit I hadn't paid that much attention, but thankfully Landry brushed it off and said, Either way, even with all the water in the world, we're still going to need to study these constellations. Understanding the cycles on the moon and even cataloging them is something that will take years. I heard a hint of uncertainty in her voice, but didn't touch on it. I knew what it was like to have something you wanted for so long be pushed aside. I figured the moon was big enough for all of us to dream. Oh, 0500 hours. I got up early, the excitement of getting to work or the disorientation of my new surroundings making it impossible to sleep. After a short jog, shower, and breakfast, I met Tyler at the main elevator that descends to the core of our dig site. Owen was already there, seemingly just as wide-eyed and eager as me. Let's go make history. He told me as the elevator shook and rattled through the lunar crust. During the interim, we all donned our spacesuits, checking our internal systems and activated our comms. It was nearly 0600 by the time we arrived at the tunnel Tyler and the others had been digging for the past several years. The massive drills they used looked to be the size of small cruise ships, and I marveled at the prospect of being able to keep all this secret from society. Sanders whistled softly as Caleb and Professor Landry set up everything needed to break the final bit of crust which separated us from the mysterious subterranean pocket. I was given the assignment to monitor the pressure and geological activity on the small substation that resembled something like an over-decorated tollbooth. 
The different monitors streamed an array of data a mile long, showing how all of the different machines worked together to break through the wall of rock. As soon as Caleb got the drill activated, the pressure valves and other readouts immediately spiked, pushing through the lunar surface like it was made of putty. The huge machines used the energy of at least a dozen tanks, blasting and destroying anything that stood in its path. Landry was there at my side, jotting down the readings as quickly as they came in. And then, all before our eyes, the final segment of the wall gave way and collapsed into nothingness. Owen shut off the machine, and we all held our breath, watching as the cloud of dust and particles revealed what laid behind the seal. What I saw was an impossibility, a city of lights and angles unlike any made by man, twisting and smooth architecture mixed together to form a sprawling metropolitan maze of gray ziggurats, crystalline walkways, and amalgamated structures. With the limited artificial light our drill and headgear supplied, it was difficult to even be sure which side was up and which was down. Wordlessly, we stepped through the broken gate to the alien city, marveling at its beauty and silence. What is this place? Caleb finally asked, his voice filled with anxiety and fear. Landry, on the other hand, offered hope and excitement to the discovery. This is the single largest discovery in the past hundred years. Oh, imagine it. This civilization is proof of life outside our Earth, possibly even our solar system. These buildings are perhaps a million years old or more. Tyler said nothing, taking it all in, a group of us keeping close to one another as we explored. Something like a whisper of wind filled the comms for the briefest of moments as I saw strange carvings upon some of the buildings. An entire language of glyphs and arithmetic. Landry said, reaching out to press her glove against the stone. A flash of memory danced across my mind. The whisper grew louder, and I heard Renee scream out. Instinctively, I grabbed Landry's wrist before she could feel the structure, and I muttered, Perhaps we should perform some tests using the machines first? For a tense moment, I thought the whispers would drown out any sane thought I had. Then Landry relaxed and nodded, motioning for Caleb to get the scanning equipment. I thought my premonition had averted a crisis, but one was only just beginning. Behind us, the beacons on the drill suddenly activated, and the massive vehicle tumbled forward without a driver. What the hell? Owen shouted in surprise as the treads of the drill pushed apart more of the wall, giving the vehicle ample room to move forward. But Owen didn't even get a chance to climb aboard the lumbering vehicle as it picked up speed. The only chance we had was to get out of the way as it pushed down segments of the ancient city and rolled straight over Owen without even as much as slowing down. The sounds of the tread smashing and crushing body like tinfoil is something that I'll never get out of my head, mixed with his screams as his lungs and spine were torn apart. It only lasted a few seconds, but for the rest of us, it seemed like an eternity. The machine continued forward until it smashed into one of the massive structures and shut down with a flash of smoke. As it collided with the stone pylon, the entire city groaned and shook as though the collective souls of the dead civilization were unquieted with the arrival of our technology. A moment later, we realized it was not an ordinary impact at all, but some sort of subterranean quake. Tyler shouted to Caleb and I as we were forced to leave Owen's mutilated body behind, and a rain of stones fell from the top of the dome. Back on the outskirts of the underground ruin, we watched in horror as our chances of exploring and learning more about it were dashed to pieces. Piles of stone and dirt blocked the path, and the three of us were fortunate to even still be standing. As the quake finally ended, our comms filled with static again. At first, I thought it was the mystic whispers from the city, but soon we heard the distinctive voice of Armitage. Professor Landry, are you alright down there? For a man down, and we've lost access to the tunnels. There was a long silence as those above let that statement sink in. Then, at last, Armitage gave an order. Well, you'd better head up top. I think shit's just got a lot worse. 0800 hours, day two. The ride back to the lunar surface was one filled with silent horror and regret over what had happened to Officer Sanders. None of us dared to even comprehend the experience of finding the city or the strange things that had happened here, and the stillness in the air made me feel at ease. It didn't let up when we arrived at the observation deck. Armitage and Commander Cyrus were waiting, both checking every system over and over again, before finally making the announcement that somehow I had anticipated. 
We've lost communication with Earth. That quake managed to disrupt our signals. We'll probably be on our own for the next 48 hours. Armitage had other bad news. Several of the sectors of the moon base would need to be sealed off due to rolling blackouts, and maintenance would need to ensure that resources were properly distributed. Cyrus gave us assignments, and before dismissal, Caleb insisted we give a small service for Officer Sanders. I was surprised that I had the least to say about him, despite the fact that I likely knew him longer than any of them. My mind was too fractured by everything else we had seen and heard. With the brief eulogy given, Tyler ordered me to join Dr. Rowland in making sure that all of the crew were properly treated. Starting with yourself, he added, giving me a cold look of disdain. Was he disappointed that I hadn't been able to save Owen, or did he think that my abilities as an officer were lacking in some area? I never knew. Ten hundred hours. Maintenance sweeps and health checks were nearly done by this time, as Roland and I moved to the staff of the Pike itself, providing them with needed medications. Someone messed with my data. I remember Clara saying as we gathered supplies. The changes were made without consultation. What happened? See for yourself. Roland said as she stepped aside and looked at the glitching screens. Occasionally, it would show strange markings and symbols that reminded me of the glyphs we had seen in the subterranean city, and that alone gave me a chill. Was it possible that some curse had been placed upon us simply for opening the chasm? What do you think it means? The doctor said. I didn't think it would be proper for me to speculate, so I quietly followed her towards the elevator and shuffled my feet uncomfortably. What? happened down there? I don't even know if I could explain it, I admitted as we made it to the observation deck. I was hoping to find some sense of normalcy here amid my fellow scientists, but once I saw the disarray of the equipment, that quickly faded away. The power was only functioning at 13%, with only a few key lights even glowing in the dark room. In the middle, I spotted Professor Landry staring up at the massive telescope she used likely on a daily basis. She seemed to have a distant and confused look on her face as Roland and I approached her. Ah, Dr. Roland. What brings you here? Landry asked as we checked her vitals. Commander wants to make sure everything is alright after the quake. Looks like you hit it pretty hard in here. Roland answered as I was putting the pressure cuff on. Landry looked down at the blackened skin on my wrist, her eyes widening as she pulled away. How did you get that? It's nothing. It's a birthmark. I said, reflexively tugging my sleeve down to hide the scar. That doesn't look like any birthmark I've ever seen. Roland pointed out as she too had a look. Something clicked for Landry as she stood up and had a frightened look on her face. The stones. You knew I shouldn't touch them. You've seen them before. I grimaced and explained. Not exactly. It was just a feeling. When I was young, my sister died from touching a meteorite. The two women silently considered what I was telling them before Landry turned to the telescope and remarked, Perhaps that is also what is happening here. Maybe we are all dying for desecration of a tomb. What are you two talking about? Does this have to do with what happened to Sanders? <laughs> Cyrus is still not telling the crew? Landry said with a laugh as she pressed her eyes against the telescope. Does he think he's an ostrich sticking his head in the sand to hide from his problems? I think we're all just a little on edge. I admitted. A moment later, as though to echo my sentiment, another loud alarm blared across the moon base. This is Officer Ferris. We're detecting severe weather in the northern sector of the base. All personnel are advised to seek shelter. Alexa said over the PA system. A meteor shower? Now? Roland whispered as we helped Professor Landry toward the elevator. This is no coincidence. Something down on that chasm awakened a terrible evil. It's going to destroy us all. Landry said frantically as all of us took the transport down from the observatory. I think you might be overreacting. I told her as I looked across the quiet lunar landscape toward the northern valley. I could see at least six massive stones from the sky careening toward us, and my mind flashed back to those final moments Renee was alive. What if the same thing happened here? One of the stones smashed into the eastern zone of the Owlsbury, sending up clouds of dust as our elevator shook and then froze on its descent. The sudden loss of power sent Professor Landry into a full panic and she clung to my shirt. Quentin, do you hear that? All of us got deathly silent as we listened and I thought I heard the strange whispers again, but this time they were far more faint. 
Roland interrupted the quiet as she tried the calm and remarked, I can't get anyone to respond. We'll have to climb down, I realized. Most of us were already wearing the needed gear, but Professor Landry seemed against the idea entirely. We go out there, and we could die. Whatever this entity is seems to have some control over our machinery. Clara and I ignored her concerns and started to gear up. We could see that another meteor was spiraling towards us already, so waiting for another solution wasn't an option. With a sense of urgency, I activated my oxygen supply and told Landry to do the same. You stay here and you'll die, with or without the help of any cosmic creature. I warned her. That seemed to jolt her back to her senses, and as we prepared for the cold terrain of the exterior, Roland used one of the tools on her suit to unlatch the emergency hatch at the bottom of the transport. As the metallic frame floated toward the void of space, Roland gave a silent countdown, and then went first, slowly drifting down the side of the tower to the main roof of the base. I insisted Landry go next, and thankfully, the scatterbrained professor didn't object. The meteor was almost on top of us. I swear to you, it sounded like it was screaming. In fact, as I followed the others down the long fall, it became impossible to hear anything else except that mindless shriek. Then, the meteor smashed directly into the side of the elevator we had just been standing inside. Just as our magnetic boots latched onto the roof, bits of debris rushed down upon us. Even with low gravity, the force of the meteor hitting the tower had caused the shower of metal to be deadly. Thankfully, most of it scattered across the roof of the base without scratching us, but as we all looked back up to see what else had been damaged, I discovered we were hardly out of the woods yet. The collision had split apart the meteor on its side, revealing something emerging as though from an egg. I heard Landry scream out in terror as it pushed apart the rock tomb it had been encased in for perhaps a millennia and the strange, amorphous creature peered down at us with a hundred eyes. Inside, now! Roland said as we struggled to open the hatch to the Pike substation. Landry stood paralyzed, staring at the alien like it was a god to be revered, and I grabbed a hold of her body, forcing her through the airlock as we protected ourselves from the invader. What the fuck is that? Roland muttered as the creature started to claw at the surface of the roof. Before any of us got a chance to speculate, we saw the strange being perform another impossible feat. It seemed to examine the structure, as though searching for weakness. Then, before our eyes, it appeared to melt and flatten its body, pushing through the thin cracks of the metallic membrane to reach us. Landry screamed again as we hurried down the stairs and the doctor tried the comms again. Shut down this entire sector. Seal it off. Do it now. The doctor ordered. We were just barely past the first barrier when the creature broke through, dropping onto the floor behind us with a resounding thud. The doctor made the mistake of looking back. Like the wife of Lot, it proved to be her undoing. Something caught a hold of her foot and she fell. Landry hesitated to help, but I pulled us along. The monster was nearly on top of us and the seal was closing. On the other side, as Landry started to have a panic attack, I activated the secondary seal listening as Dr. Roland was the monster's first victim. Quentin, what's happened? Alexa asked over the comms once both seals were in place. I knew it wouldn't hold off the creature forever, but it would give us time to make it to the forward command center. We're on our way to you. We'll explain once there, I said as I helped Landry to her feet. Snap out of it! I said as I shook her. Her puffy eyes darted toward the door as we heard the creature let out a howl and then suddenly grew silent. We didn't stay around long enough to see if it was going to do more than that. 1100 hours. Tyler gave Professor Landry a mild sedative as I debriefed the commander and Alexa about the creature and the incident on the pike. Both of them listened quietly without saying a word as I finished the astonishing tale and then at last, Alexa made the first inquiry. And you said you lost all functions to the systems? It was like the creature managed to take them over, I told them. She gestured for me to follow her over to one of the monitors, where Armitage was reviewing security footage of the incident. I watched as Roland, Landry, and I descended after the meteor struck and scrambled into the base, but there was no sign of the creature anywhere, no indication that it had ever killed the doctor. As the professor and I closed the door on the feed, all that we had locked out was the doctor herself. I don't understand. That isn't what happened. I stuttered as I stepped away from the screen. We're considering unsealing the sector to have my security team take a second look, Commander Cyrus proclaimed. No, you do that and the creature will kill you, I told them, but all of them gave me a skeptical look. 
Alexa placed her hand on my shoulder and gave me a comforting squeeze. What we experienced down below with Sanders was terrifying. No one is denying that. And the meteor storm has likely also caused you undue stress. I stepped away from her, realizing what she was implying. You think that Landry and I made it up? Certainly not. In your mind, the creature was quite real, and that's all it was. A hallucination of your anxiety. Commander Cyrus responded. Then how do you account for Dr. Roland's disappearance? Surely I'm not hallucinating that. I snapped back. Alexa let out a sigh as she glanced over to where Landry was finally calming down and remarked, Don't make me sedate you too, Quentin. The crew has been through enough. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Fine, open the seal. You'll see for yourself what the beast did to Roland. I told them both. Cyrus and the security chief exchanged a worried glance and then gave the orders. I don't know what I was expecting to happen. Of course, nothing was there, not even the fragments of Roland's body. Let's try and find Dr. Roland immediately. It's quite likely she also may be experiencing these vivid hallucinations. I'm coming with you, I told her as I snuck a small surgical blade into my pocket. I don't know what I hoped to accomplish with this minuscule weapon, but I didn't want them to find whatever was controlling Roland's body, and then it have the element of surprise. Alongside Alexa and Tyler, we marched to the base of the pike. I scanned the corridor for the claw marks the strange monster had made, only to see nothing at all. No twisted metal was bent out of shape, not even a single drop of blood from where Roland had tripped. It didn't make sense. What I had seen felt real. I puzzled over it a moment longer as we turned the corridor and I saw Dr. Roland lying still on the cold floor. Alexa called for two nurses to arrive with the stretcher as she checked to see if Roland had sustained any injuries. We can't even be sure this thing is Clara. I whispered. Tyler glared at me, pushing me back as he helped lift the physician off the floor. Vitals appear stable. She's going to be all right. Captain Alexa said with a nod. I saw a moment of opportunity to test my theory and scratched Clara's left wrist. The two officers next to me made a soft huff in surprise as I nicked an artery, but Roland didn't awaken and red blood dripped from the cut. Officer, I'm going to have to quarantine you if you pull another stunt like that. Alexa snarled as she grabbed the surgical tool out of my hand. I was so sure it wasn't her. I whispered. I watched as the medical team took her away and then stared down at the small drop of blood that now stained the tile floor. What had happened here to make my nightmares seem so real? 1400 hours. Commander Cyrus ordered Officer Armitage and the other maintenance staff to begin making repairs to the Pike's elevator and to the other segments of the base that were affected by the meteor shower. I also learned that Dr. Clara made a quick recovery and has been assisting Landry and others on board the Osbury to cope with the recent string of dramatic events. Given that I too was affected by this, I've chosen to see the doctor and to apologize for my actions against her. 1500 hours. Roland arranged to see me and to run an EKG to see if I may be suffering from PTSD from Sanders' death, but I am afraid I no longer feel certain of her trustworthiness. She performed the test perfectly, just like I thought she would, but one thing I noted as she was messing with her equipment in her lab, the woman cast no shadow upon the floor or any of her surroundings. I double-checked as I stood up and noticed that I could see everyone else's shadows, just not hers. Whoever or whatever this was, Whoever or whatever this is, it isn't Dr. Clara Rowland. Until I can find out the truth, I will be sealing myself in my quarters. Day 4, 2100 hours. Sleep is something that takes some time getting used to in limited gravity of the moon, even under normal circumstances. The last 24 hours have been anything except, and I was bordering on hallucinations. I insisted that I did not need a sedative especially not coming from Dr. Roland, whom I was still convinced was not entirely human. So instead, I sealed myself in my room and forced exhaustion to take hold of my body the old-fashioned way. To think, I came all the way to the moon to explore, only to feel the safest in a room no wider than a small car. The familiar angles and soothing colors made me feel at ease, and eventually I drifted off. Although, after the experience I had amid my dreams, I am quick to recognize that perhaps insomnia is a safer route. I was being hunted by faceless creatures in the forest of my childhood, trying desperately to hide in the darkness that the woods offered, but the monster knew my every move. I paused to catch my breath, trying not to let the scent linger for too long, 
to remind my addled brain it was only a nightmare that I needed to wake up from. But the incessant shrill cries of the beast made instinct take over and I kept running. I could see my old home, the one Renee and I grew up in, and I told myself that if I reached that place, I would be safe. As though emulating this, the screams from the alien grew fainter as I got closer and closer. I was going to make it, but another voice rang clear in my head telling me to stop. My sister Renee, Don't! Don't do it, Quentin! Don't! She kept repeating, crying out to me. I froze in the dream and saw the monster right on top of me. It raised its flailing body to crush me completely, and it was only in those last faint seconds of sanity I managed to take over my body and awaken. When I jolted from my bed, I saw strange yet familiar scratches on my body. The nightmare had some connection to reality, even if it was a tethering I didn't fully understand. I needed to work, the anxious restlessness of my mind telling me that any more sleep could kill me, so I began to wander the halls of the Owlsbury, searching aimlessly almost for a sense of normalcy. I soon found that none existed any longer here among the stars. Alexa and her security detail were doing their best to keep everyone working. The repairs to the eastern section, where the meteor had done the most damage, would likely take weeks to finish, and the pike itself was closed down until further notice. I thought you were given orders to rest, Tyler said, as I approached where he and the remaining science officers were setting by a lunar drone to go up into the wreckage of the tower and take footage of it. I figured I could see what you were screwing up, and it might lull me to sleep. I countered as I saw them finish up the camera feed. Now they would see everything it did when it traveled into that broken structure. You set it up on a remotely controlled server? I asked as I checked the specs. Just in case what you said about the city below is correct. I felt a sigh of relief wash over me to think that at least he was considering the possibility that I wasn't crazy. But that only reminded me that everyone on the base was still on edge and nothing was being given as far as answers. What do you think happened? I whispered to him. He shook his head his eyes showing a hint of fear. That place was haunted. I know we are meant to be scientists, but there is little in our conventional textbooks that can explain what we saw there with our own eyes. Physics cannot solve this, and I'm afraid our commanding staff doesn't quite understand that. He told me somberly. Are you saying that we should try less conventional methods? Something connected to fringe science or the paranormal? Commander Gordon hired us for our field to study. Maybe it was meant to be that yours included such unorthodox ideas. I shrugged it off and remarked, even if that is true, how would we go about giving something like that a try? He didn't offer a theory and returned to work, almost as though he thought that continuing our discussion was dangerous. Were Cyrus and the other senior staff listening in on us? I decided my new task would be to find Professor Landry and make sure she was all right. So I left Tyler to his work and wandered the southern quarters. I was midway down the flight of stairs to the base gymnasium when I heard what sounded like scratching coming from inside the walls. Given that I have been prone to hearing things in the last 48 hours that amounted to nothing, I ignored it at first. But the more I tried to quiet the noise, the louder it seemed to grow. A constant, incessant frustration of nails and claws digging their way out of the walls. Where was it coming from? Suddenly, all that mattered was figuring it out. I imagined that if someone else were there in those corridors and saw me wandering about, I would have looked like a madman. And maybe that was the correct assumption to make. The hours were racing by in the twilight as I scrambled to find the noise, leading me back toward the library, and a quiet, soothing voice told me this is where I needed to go. Stepping inside, I found myself amid a disarray of books, some piled all the way up to the ceiling of the room and also the scratching. It was louder here and more persistent, like claws on a chalkboard. It didn't take me long to find the source. Professor Landry was standing alone near the west wall, having cleared the shelves and pushed the case itself aside. She was scrawling strange runic markings on the metallic plating itself. I recognized the symbols instantly as the glyphs from the city below. How had she memorized them so quickly? I wondered as I slowly stepped toward her, trying to break her from her methodical task of scribbling. When she turned her eyes to me, all I saw was a blank void. The professor was caught in a trance that was beyond her control. She pushed me away and continued the writing, muttering to herself the need to finish it as though it were some elaborate puzzle. 
I focused on the language as well, trying my best to see if there were patterns to the madness. Surely there were secrets beyond our comprehension, if only we could make sense to it. What could this possibly be? I whispered. To my surprise, Landry broke free from her hypnotic state and offered a guess. A prophecy of blood. A war to be raged between two gods, both of discord and chaos. And our world, the battleground. Their bones tell us how it will end. The angles, the intricate shapes that go beyond the dimensions we understand. They are telling us a story, Quentin. All we need to do is open our minds and accept their call. She hissed as she placed my hand upon the cold metal surface. In that bizarre moment, I had a vision. I was suddenly back on Earth, standing on a mountaintop. Landry was gone as well, replaced by my dear sister. Renee looked scared. Her eyes wandered across the countryside as she gestured for me to follow. The air thick as I hesitated to follow. Surely this wasn't real. My sister looked as though she had aged far more than I remembered when she was alive, and the world around us felt almost primordial, a place of ghosts and spirits. But I saw no path to take me back to where I came, so I did walk with her down a winding trail toward a deep valley. The dark consumed everything here, and amid the shadows I saw a congregation of people that were waiting for us. Yes. It felt as if they were intentionally holding off whatever their intentions were because of our presence. A massive bonfire flickered and hypnotized them as we drew closer, but I could not determine from where it burned. They turned their attention to us, eyes as placid as the swirling ocean, and gave me a set of instructions. The shadowless spread and rise to consume that which belongs to the undying. Your blood must be offered to stop the infection. Take the blade of unholy sacrifice. I didn't understand why I willingly obeyed, but I reached toward the fire. Amid the scorching pain, I felt something sharp and deadly. When I pulled out my hand, I saw that I had retrieved a dark, vile blade. Somehow I knew it had killed many before me, and it would again strike down hundreds after I was gone. I heard Renee beg for death. She was burning again before my eyes as a child, desperate to be free of the pain. The blade could offer her that. I could be her salvation. I grabbed her and pinned her to the ground, holding the blade near her chest. She had fear in her eyes, but I whispered that it would be okay. Let me help you, I said. She didn't resist, and I plunged the knife into her chest over and over. I had to finish it. I had to help my sister from the pain she was enduring. Then my sister started to fade away. She was replaced with the professor that I had been speaking with only moments earlier except the wounds were still the same. Landry was choking on her own blood, and somehow or another, the knife I thought which was only my imagination was there in my hand. I dropped it and stood up, my own clothes covered in blood as I called out for help. The archives were empty, save for me. Then I saw something beyond a nightmare. It stretched and pushed its way out of Landry's throat, pushing her skin out of the way a puffer fish could but it was like a waft of smoke that somehow had a form of its own. It occurred to me this being was reminiscent of the one that crawled out of the meteor, the one Alexa and the commander said did not exist. As it oozed and melted and destroyed Landry's body, I rose and found the security alarm, trying to get help as fast as I could. I didn't want my own sanity tested again if this creature could somehow slip away into whatever dream I'd been born from. The creature slithered and pushed across the tile floor trying to find me, shrieking into the air and hungry for my blood. It reminded me of what the vision had told me about these creatures. They were seeking vessels, corporeal forms to control and guide as puppets. At my side, TJ appeared, pushing his way toward Landry and calling out for more help. I heard the creature snarl and began to hunt him, and I held my ground, trying to tell myself this wasn't real. Armitage reached down to touch Landry and try to give her aid, the monster stretching its body on top of him. Quentin, what have you done? He asked, turning toward me, yet he didn't react toward the creature. Was it not there at all, or was I the only one seeing its wicked power? I moved toward it, determined to save Armitage, even if it was only from my own broken mind. I slammed toward the faceless monster and pushed it against the wall. I heard TJ cuss and exclaim something. He was pinned as well. Would I harm him the same way I had Landry? 
I could see myself doing it easily. Then the creature began to melt and ooze into him, his eyes and mouth meshing with it as it entered his body. I told myself I wouldn't let it happen, but I was powerless to stop it. Others rushed into the room, seeing the violence, and took us apart. I kept kicking and screaming until at last Tyler plunged a syringe into my neck. Darkness was far more welcoming this time. No nightmares were going to harm me in this cold, dense fog. It was the waking I feared. 0900 hours, day 5. When Captain Alexa reviewed the tapes, this time I knew what to expect. My fractured mind was showing the monsters that only I could see, driving me to the point of insanity where I was harming my teammates. Landry was dead, the loss of blood proving too fatal for her, and Armitage was in critical condition, festering some infection that Dr. Roland claimed she didn't comprehend. There is one thing that does fit with your story, though. These symbols. We don't know what they are, and yet they seem to possess you and Francine. Alexa commented as she examined the still screens again. What does it all mean? I whispered. I saw a glint of doubt in her eye as I sat up and realized something. You've seen these symbols before. Tell me where. Was it on Earth? The captain nodded and admitted. It's like a half-remembered dream. It was an ancient book of witchcraft and prophecy. I hardly can believe I forgot it. In college, the thing gave me nightmares. She turned to where Armitage was slowly coming back around and ordered me to stay put, checking on his vitals. I hated to be on the sidelines, but what else could I do? I was lucky that I hadn't been locked away like a feral animal. I watched from the soundproof glass to see Ferris's reaction as Dr. Roland gave them some results from the lab. The way the captain became animated and irate told me all I needed to know. Something happened in the archives that couldn't be accounted for. Perhaps the alien life form I had imagined was in fact detectable after all. For some reason, this terrible revelation was comforting to me. 1500 hours, day 5. That comfort didn't last long though, for soon the madness we had confirmed as being real finally took hold of Armitage. I was in and out of sleep, trying to rest and recover when I felt something move in the room, and suddenly I was fully awake. I turned to look around the room. Most of the technicians were busy doing lab work, but I saw that something was happening over in the makeshift room they had given Armitage. His readings were off the chart, and his body was beginning to convulse. Hey, hey, someone help! I called out, but the others didn't seem to hear or care. TJ sat up and looked straight toward me. He took off his cardiac equipment and started to limp toward me, and I panicked. Would he be angry at me for trying to save him earlier? His eyes looked wild and full of fear. We are enemies, not in the forms we are familiar with now, but one day we will. Across the stars, our battle will rage. He whispered. There was something foaming from his mouth. When he turned toward one of the emergency seals and I called for help again, the techs were moving toward us, but I was already too late. In a short moment, Armitage had pressed the security code and the seal began to decompress. The vacuum of space suddenly took hold of everything in the room, papers and glass pushing toward the open airlock as TJ screamed into the void. His body was broken and twisted into the seal, hitting the walls along with several other technicians as they were all taken out across the stars like garbage. Only the latches that I had on my medical table kept me from experiencing the same fate. The vacuum continued for another few moments until at last emergency systems took over when I was alone, the room devoid of life from Armitage's suicide. There was one thing I did not understand though, whether this was an action of the monster that had taken control of his mind or his last desperate act of free will. I came to the stars in search of purpose, to be a part of something greater. I am regretting that ambition now. I am forced to say goodbye to another comrade. I've hardly had time to comprehend why this place has turned on us, and now so many have perished. Worst of all, I can't help but feel that I am personally responsible for what's going on. There's something inside me, festering and screaming to control my will. I have felt it ever since we discovered the subterranean city, and now, as we are struggling to understand what is happening here, it is refusing to stay quiet. It has killed many of the colleagues that I have only begun to meet, and I think, if left unchecked, it could destroy us all. Because, as I found out from the suicide of our chief engineer, 
It is a call that can't be ignored forever. 1700 hours, day 5. Captain Ferris, Commander Cyrus, and my direct supervisor, Tyler White, were checking the systems to make sure that what Armitage had just accomplished couldn't happen again. All airlock seals require two-person authorization now, Cyrus said as they offered me a respirator. But I didn't need to catch my breath. I needed answers. Surely you see now that we are under attack, Cyrus sighed. He was tired and scared, but I could see he wasn't sure what to make of the incidents on the Allsbury thus far. What matters is that the generators will be back up in six hours and we can contact the surface. We should all consider heading back for reconnaissance. If we aren't all dead by then, you mean? Don't test me, Quentin. I could have you thrown in the brig for what you did to Landry. Heaven knows I tried to convince him to let me at you, Alexis said, sticking a finger in my face. Cyrus gave a gruff bark and the security chief stood back. Then Cyrus made a short summary of the events, as though it were all logically explainable. And Sanders were tragic accidents. The other accidents are a result of mass hysteria. From what we know we uncovered below our feet, it's a wonder that any of us are maintaining sanity. We have shaken the very foundations of our understanding of the universe. I knew arguing would get me nowhere, so I merely saluted and asked where I could be of service. Dr. Roland hasn't said you're fit for duty. Tyler reminded me. I huffed at that, but then I gave an idea. I can go see her first thing in the morning, if that's alright with you, Commander. Cyrus pursed his lips, as though he were going to deny the request, but I added, I just want to be useful. That's why I was recruited, wasn't I? Cyrus nodded and gave the approval. Now all I had to do was make sure I didn't screw up my plan, considering how crazy it was. I didn't hold my breath. 0800 hours, day 6. Tyler came to take me to Roland in the morning. Since the main medical bay was no longer in use, the doctor was now using the command center at the base of the pike, assisting with the study of the meteorite that had struck the tower. I thought you said you didn't trust her, Tyler whispered as he walked down the south corridor. I don't, but I need you to trust me. Please, I said as we got closer. I can't unless I know what you are planning. I need to get a sample of the doctor's blood. If I'm right and the alien host is thriving inside her body, there has to be some evidence of that. Jesus. Well, I guess I should have known it would be nuts, Tyler said dryly as we entered the small makeshift clinic. Roland was nowhere to be found, so while we had a few extra moments, Tyler forced me to look at him. This could go very wrong, you know. And if it does... I know. You have to look out for yourself. I understand. I'm on your side, but... This whole mess has gotten out of hand. Quentin, I was wondering when you might show your face here. Tyler made a short cough into his fist and remarked, <clears throat> That's my cue to get back to maintenance. As I was left alone with the doctor, she gestured for me to sit and remarked, I hear you have had quite a few brushes with death since the last time we talked. Sadly, it's always someone else that pays the price. Roland nodded and said, Gordon tells me you want to be fit to help with the repairs and... While I can't see any issues with your physical condition, I am concerned about the decline in your mental health. I told you already, I haven't been sleeping well, I said, trying to brush it off. I needed her to be distracted, so I muttered, How many of your staff are left now? We both know that you didn't come here for such idle banter, Roland said as she idly turned the tools on her surgical tray and remarked, You've become convinced that I am not fully human. Ever since you caught sight of those relics in the cave below. That speaks a lot to your psychological profile, you know. And what does it mean, in your professional opinion? I wondered as I took a step closer toward the doctor. It's only a natural, instinctive reaction to something you can't fundamentally understand yet. I was scared too, but I've seen that what is being offered here is too great to pass up. Knowledge beyond the tangible existence we ever thought possible. Why are you telling me this? I asked nervously. Suddenly, the perfect plan I had outlined didn't seem like it was going to work. Was it possible that the creature that was controlling her could read my mind? We are connected. Ever since we came here. You can't deny that. We both have seen and experienced more than our colleagues could give us credit for. If so, why did you not vouch for my credibility? You've had ample opportunities to do so. This was getting out of hand. An outcome I hadn't expected, and yet somehow Roland was taking control of the situation. 
You've become convinced I am the enemy here, Quentin. I'm not. I can show you what you lack. You just have to trust me. She said with gleaming eyes. I saw an opening and I struck, grabbing a hold of the scalpel and slashing at her throat. Immediately I saw the fungus spread out of her open wound and spit in the alien's face. I will never trust an abomination like you, I said. As it kept on attacking, I saw blood and light streak from her face. But to my surprise, throughout the entire ordeal, Roland was laughing. You will never stop it! Never! Behind me, the doors to the command center burst open, and Alexa ran in with the guards. I didn't even get a chance to explain before a series of electrodes was sent through my body and I tumbled to the floor. When I woke up, I was in the brig, just as Alexa had been promising for days. The voices inside my head were finally quiet, though, and I wondered if I had succeeded in stopping the monsters that were attacking us. It's not over. A whisper came from the shadows. I jolted up, to my surprise seeing Clara's features grafted on the wall, her ghostly visage taunting me from beyond the grave. He wanted me to attack? Death is nothing for these creatures, Quentin. Surely what happened at the Pike should have told you that. I am merely a vessel, as you too soon will be. A glorious battle is about to occur, and the Earth will be theirs with us none the wiser." The spirit said as it shifted and swam through the metal. No, I will fight it. You may think whatever you please. The beauty of it is that you will believe you are in control. I turned away from her mockery, frustrated that my attempts to save us still seemed to go nowhere. I could only think of one final solution to get back to Earth and warn them. I had to assume that everyone on Allsbury was now infected, so asking for help was out of the question. I was on my own. I slumped down to the cot in the middle of the brig to try and concoct a plan as I slipped my hands into my pockets and felt something there. Pulling it out, I found myself smiling. It was the remote control from the Pike drone. Tyler had slipped it into my pocket before I met with the doctor. I sat down and studied the controls thinking of how I could use the drone to my advantage. My recollection told me that the machine was tied into the network of the moon base, so if I could access the control panel outside the brig, it was possible it could get me out of here. I needed to act without hesitation. It took me a while to get the hang of the controls and begin to pilot the craft, smiling to see that Tyler had wisely kept it close to my current location in the base of the pike. All I needed to do was move it close enough to access the exterior of the room I was fitted inside and I could be free. Moving the machine proved a little bit trickier than I imagined it would be. It reminded me of the small RVs Dad would get me for Christmas. I could even hear Renee giggle as I bumped into every wall along the way and narrowly avoided being stepped on. No one would pay attention to the drone, and I would use that to my advantage. The remote control that Tyler had given me came with a tiny screen to see what the drone saw, and it made me reconsider the way I've been treating this place. I imagined the moon being full of opportunities, possibilities, and structure. But the halls were empty, the corridors devoid of any life. Was this even meant to be a colonization project at all? It didn't seem likely. I shrugged away the odd sense of foreboding and finally got the drone to the outside of my door. In a few short moments, I had gained access to the network to set me free, but I knew my struggle wouldn't be over if I simply walked out. Alex and the others will just lock me in a tighter cell once they've realized what happened, I thought as I stepped out and checked the network. I began to formulate a plan in my head. I set things in motion by keeping the drone at my side and sneaking into a nearby locker room. Before I could begin, I would need to be certain I had the proper equipment to make it to an escape pod. I made it to TJ's old locker, saw his suit still hanging there, and got changed. It was a bit disconcerting to wear clothes that belonged to a man that had just died, but I needed to leave this place without interruption. Once the spacesuit was securely on my body, I checked the drone again and finished the shutdown operations. With luck, I would be able to walk through Owlsbury unobstructed. As I input the authorization codes, the voices that have guided me here on the moon this entire time grew like a hornet's nest being knocked over. Someone was coming. Alarms blared as I activated the suit's magnetic boots and began to move to the east corridor. The intercom announced that it would take 17 minutes for emergency systems to recalibrate. 
I would only need half that much to make it to the escape pod. The noise of the intercom and the screams in my head became so loud that I almost became disoriented as I made it to the hangar bay, pleased that my bizarre escape plan had somehow been successful. Don't move another muscle, Quentin, a voice said as I made my way down the steps to the pod. I raised my hands defensively, turning to see Captain Alexa standing there in her own suit with a pistol aimed at my head. This has gone on too long, Alexa said as the alarms grew louder in my ears. The shrieks were telling me to finish her, to get out of here before she too tried to stop me, so before she had a chance to act, I was rushing towards her. She let a single shot fire, but the limited gravity did nothing to stop me. I pushed the gun out of her hand and pressed her against the wall of the hangar. Captain, you may think I'm insane, but this is how I plan to save our species. I said as I pressed a few key buttons on her suit and watched her lose oxygen. Alexa's eyes widened in shock until her skin became crystallized. Her skin as brittle as glass. She was a frozen statue of pristine beauty and stark destruction. My hands trembled as I used them to access the escape pod and tried not to focus on the vile deed I had just committed. My resolve had never been stronger, and as I stepped into the pod, I realized that I had made it. My resolve had helped me escape this hell. A few systems came online as the noise in the background faded away. According to the online display, I would be back on Earth in a little over three days. The door to the hangar opened slowly and purposefully as I looked out towards Ferris's floating corpse, an immediate feeling of remorse overcoming me. They were all infected, all a threat to our survival, I told myself. As the doors finished opening, the pod asked one final time if the sequences were correct and I pressed for confirmation. I was jettisoned into the stars a few short seconds later. My eyes drifted toward the pike, reflecting on the strange discoveries we had made there. Our species is not alone in the universe, but it is also ill-equipped to prepare for what is to come. The strange angles of the pike faded as my pod got further and further away, and I saw the tower in a new light. Now it looked dark and foreboding, an invitation to the darkness that was spreading out across the entire base. Had we ever had a chance to escape, or was this cosmic invasion something that we were only delaying? I pressed my hand against the glass as the moon faded into the stars and sighed in frustration, wishing I knew the answers. Zero hundred hours, day ten. My pod slammed into the calm waters of the northern Atlantic right at the midnight hour, a fresh slate to be written on the history of our species. The last few days on the moon already fading to nothing but a memory. I sent out a distress signal hoping that someone would come, but my equipment told me there was a chance I might not survive that long. Some inner strength told me to push forward, to warn others of the evil I had seen, and it was that untapped potential that kept me alive until rescue came. Zero one thirty hours. I was tested, given food and new clothing as I explained to the crew of the ship that had found me who I was and why they needed to take me to America immediately. I had to get the information I now retained to the highest office possible as quickly as I could. Uh, you won't be going anywhere, officer. Not until we determine exactly what happened up here, the commander told me. I know you are frightened by my words, but I'm telling the truth. We know that you think you are, but we've been monitoring events on the Owlsbury for some time, soldier. As far as we can tell, the only threat that faced the crew was you. You went on a rampage, concocted an alien invasion inside your head, and killed the majority of the team. The commander snarled. I was at a loss for words as they left me alone. A few key moments of my lunar journey played out in my mind. Sanders, Landry, even Armitage, they were all scared of me. I was the monster. It had infected me and used me, not them. The whispers wriggled their way into my brain again and I realized what a fool I had been. I had given this creature exactly what it wanted, to be on Earth. I was the puppet all along. I looked toward the walls and saw the writhing mass of ghosts and spirits, and just barely out of my view, Renee was there, right on the edge of my vision, smiling. Now we are together.
Hey everyone, I'm excited to see what you thought of that story. One of my theories that I had about the story, which I think it makes kind of obvious, is that the alien thing that lands on there is like a weapon or something from this alien race that is maybe on their way to Earth. Maybe the city they see is something connected to that alien race, but I'm not 100% sure. But I am curious to see what you all think about it. I like how this story had elements of not knowing if the character's crazy. I really like those types of stories. And I liked how the story went with it just being the alien thing, like possessing people. I don't have too many other thoughts, but I am curious to see what you all think of the sci-fi stories I've been doing lately. I've been seeing a lot of comments from you all saying you wanted more of that. I'm keeping an eye out for some other sci-fi stories, and if you have any story suggestions or anything you'd like to see, be sure to let me know. And with that said, have a good weekend.